Today we're going to be talking about time varying and streaming data. And um, let's go right to it. So there's this little story here, you know, when you read it, like it says Wednesday, 28th, April 1999, posted 11.33 p.m. EDT, East LA time. Another robbery occurred in southwestern Ontario today, making this the fourth robbery in the past <clears throat> few months. Delaware Bank in Brentford was robbed by three masked individuals who stole $150,000 in currency and several unknown items, and so on and so on. It tells like how many lasting five minutes, injuring eight people. There was a load they were talking about the hospital. Then the first robbery, then there's another robbery in some other place where they opened the safe and so on. This is a really long story, right? And if you have to read this, you know, it's, it's really hard to figure out what really happened when. You know, you have to really keep track of everything, you know, which takes, you know, then you once you get to the end of the story, you probably don't remember anymore what happened in the beginning. So, you know, what you want to do is like really, you know, come up with something better, right? Because these temp people have trouble, oftentimes trouble with time because temporal ordering can be hard to determine, right? You don't really know what happened before and what happened later, <clears throat> especially when they happen in the spatial disjoint locations, right? You don't know if something happened in Denver, if that had anything to do that happened in, in, in Chicago two minutes later, right? I mean, you don't really, you know, you don't really know if the event in Chicago was really related to the event in Denver or not, right? And then it depends, like, is it two minutes? Is that enough for a causal effect? Or maybe you need 20 minutes or two hours? Nowadays, with, you know, rapid speed of social networking, right, something that happened in two minutes can already have an effect in a very, in a very, in a very distant area. So time is just really complicated to deal with because, you know, you never quite know if there was a causal effect or not, you know, and if they're disjoint and so on, right? So this is like one, one thing. Secondly, if you, look, if you look at this particular item that I just read to you, piece, 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 a piece of it at least, you know, you may have to reread this several times and you'll have to make inferences based on this information that you've saw. And, and you don't really know if, if they were related or not, right? In terms of, because there's time involved, right? Another thing, so what you really want to do is like, you want to like use visualization to help you externalize these relationships. So just put it all on a, on a canvas, on a paper, and then, then look at it. So you can sort of figure out what happened before and if there's any cause and effect and things like this. So one way to do this, this, you know, I'll show you in a second, like about, I'll show you in a second one of those, one of those visualizations you can use, you know, but first I want to like talk a little bit about this concept of time, which is, which is really something that, 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 you know, that is really difficult to deal with. And it's very different than spatial dimensions, right? Because time, you know, things that happen in time, you can't undo it, right? It happened. When things happen in a spatial location, you can go with an eraser and erase it again, it's gone. Right. It may have been there for a little bit, but it's gone, right? Or you can go back and do something with that, you know, and, and remove it, right? You can, you can always do that. With time, you cannot do it, right? It's sort of, a, it's sort of a, like a final kind of thing, right? What happened in time, it's locked, and then, you know, you can't, un you can't undo it, right? It's always there, right? When, 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 unless you remove it spatially, but if you, you know, kill someone at a particular time, you can't undo it, right? Because, you know, you can't go back in time to make it unhappen. Right. That's the problem with time. So that's why time is always this sort of special dimension, right, in visualization too. You know, it's very different because you can't go back and then, you know, you, you don't have a control over it, right? Usually you don't because once you say something, you know, it can be unsaid, especially if it's captured on video, like this lecture, for example. You know, it's, it's really something, but what's nice about time, it's, it's sort of something you can order things. You know, you can order things. If it happens at the same location, you can clearly order, right? If it happens in different locations, then you'll have to figure out if there's like any, any way you could connect this, with, if you connect these locations in terms of a, some sort of wire, right? It can be a, a real wire or some sort of you know, virtual wire. You know, if you tell someone something on a phone who is like, you know, half around the globe, you know that what you said had an effect on that person you know, in, in one minute from now, right? Because that's how long it took to, for, for the sound to arrive or something like this, right? 
But if that person didn't, wasn't connected with the wire, you know, and then had and witnessed you saying something, then it's well, much harder to, to, to tie things together. So that's basically why time is sort of an interesting dimension, okay? So calendars have a preference frame, you know, so Gregorian, Greenwich, ADT, you know, oftentimes time is used in relative terms, today, yesterday, and before Tuesday. So you don't know if someone says, Today, is that your today or his today, right? Does he, does, he, does he live in the same time zone or in a different time zone? You know, oftentimes you say someone, I'll, I'll meet you, I want to meet you tomorrow, that you don't know, right? If, that, if you say it in Hawaii and that person is in Tokyo, right? Then tomorrow is already, you know, today for that person, right? So it's very dif difficult, right? So you have to come it, you have to bring it in a common reference framework, right? And when you hear things like this, the robbery is similar to the crime spree that started in a Chinese New Year, then, then you'll have to know what the Chinese New Year is, right? And some people may not know that. So that, could, that, that is basically a reference system that is not known, right? If you say, happened on Christmas, not everyone knows where Christmas is, right? So you have to come up with something that everyone can agree, agree on, right? So this is basically back to this example that I had before, right? With this story, remember the story that I, that I read to you? Hopefully I didn't put you asleep reading the story. So this is this, this time diagram that goes with the story. Okay, so February, March, April, May, this is like the timeline, right? And then these are the different banks. This is spatial location where things happened. And this is the reconstruction of these events, right? So you have here's the timeline, like the x-axis, different spatial locations, and the way they're linked together with this line, right? So it was the first robbery, then the safe, you know, blown, and then the, there was another, you know, rob the bank, and then here is the last one, right? So, and then you can sort of minimum and maximum, right? Is that at least, at most, right? You indicate that with this sort of like uncertainty kind of circle, right? And, and so this is like a way to really summarize this big story, right? Just summarize it in a di diagram where you, can, where you can reason with it, right? So this is a very common way to represent you know, and then you can, of course, augment it, and you'll see a few more examples of that. You know, so that this is basically a common way to encode time-bearing events with a, with a line, sort of a flow chart like this, right? So then often asked questions are like, when? So this is basically something you can analyze in a, in a time series, right? And then, you know, and then, and then use just standard new, operators to figure out what it was like for example when was something greatest or least you, know, you could just go to the time series and then look when was something greatest or least and just report that time you know then you can build a difference right you can also compute patterns right you can like maybe something gets goes to the greatest and then to the least and then back to the greatest back to the least so there's like some sort of pattern that happens a lot right and you remember in the beginning we talked about motifs like that where you look for patterns that repeat each other, one that repeat, that, re that keep repeating, right? So you can say of like come up with a pattern, you know, for example, an EKG, right? A, a signal that the heart, heart, heart beat, right? That always something that keeps coming, right? And if there's an unusual, you can, you can compute an outlier, right? The, the entire heartbeat is always the same. Or e, EEG pattern, very similar, right? Or like some sort of, you know, speech, speech pattern, right? Happens a lot, right? Then, then you can mine these things, right? You can look for patterns that are shared. You can cluster them. You have to figure out how, how big those patterns are, where you start the pattern, where you end it. This is called subsequence analysis. You try to find the subsequence in the time series. You know, what is, the, what is the left end of the pattern? What is the right end of the pattern? And actually, that is a very hard problem to figure out what really is a subsequence, right? Where does it begin? Where a pattern begins? Because you could find patterns anywhere, right? I mean, you can just make it begin a little earlier, a little later, and all of a sudden you find a repetition of it, right? So it's very, very interesting to subsequence analysis is actually a really big challenge to find actually what are the subsequences. Sometimes it's easy to find out the week is always, you know, a pattern appears over the week or over every day or over every, every two days or every hour of a minute, something like this becomes like a subsequence. Then, but sometimes you just don't know, right? The stock market may not happen exactly every, every day the same way, right? So there may be interesting patterns that you can find out. Having, having to find these subsequences is actually a really difficult problem. So 
now want to figure out are two time series similar, right? So you can, you know, you can just take the time to time series and align them and then compute, you know, like a distance metric, like Euclidean correlation, you know, cosine distance, anything that you've learned before, right? That can figure out. The problem is just the alignment. Now with the COVID-19 virus, you've seen very interesting visualizations where they try to align the different patterns that different countries make in terms of the, where they meet, where they, where they reach the plateau and then fall off, right? You basically try to align them by, by the first, that the first death occurred or the after the 10th death occurred, right? You basically take each of these countries, align them by the 10th death, the COVID-19 death that occurred, and then, and then align those basically time series along one another, right? And just see where, where which country peaks earlier, which peaks later, how much they peak, you know, how, how long they peak, and when they fall off, right? And you can see the plateaus too. I'm sure you have seen these kind of visualizations, right? I mean, you know, I, I can put them to the into the lecture next uh, before I publish it, right? So this is how you can align time series, like find something that is shared, some event that is shared, and plot them side by side. Then also another question is like, if the data element exists at time t and when, so it's basically a search operation, remember like this is a search operation, how long does it exist and how often does it come? It's like a motif kind of thing. How fast they're changing, that's the rate. You can just compute a derivative of it and see where the peak of the derivative is, right? First derivative. And then in what order do they appear? So you have to rank them. And or or simultaneously two, two, two data elements exist together on the same curve. So basically you have to overlap them, right? And see if there's a covariant co if there is a correlation, cross-correlation that in that case, and find out when how far they are apart, right? You can take a pattern and cross-correlate with another pattern and see how far, how distant they were, right? That, that kind of thing you come out. So there's different types of time series. There is the, uh, you know, discrete versus interval, linear versus cyclic, ordinary versus continuous, ordinary versus continuous, ordered versus branching, right? Basically, this is the time multiple perspective, right? You can look at the time, but from a different vantage point, okay? So I have a little example of this soon. So, here is basically two time series, NVIDIA stock versus the NASDAQ. NVIDIA is a GPU company. This is a pretty old one. You can sort of see the NVIDIA, the NASDAQ is the, the, the red one and the NVIDIA is the blue one. So NASDAQ is a composite of many stocks, right? So you expect it to be a little bit flattened, right? So NVIDIA seems a little bit more vigorous. It goes up more goes down more and then follows a little bit and goes down more. But the trend is similar, right? It just has a little, it has more, you know, it is more, basically more sensitive to change, right? It, 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 it you know, it responds much more severely to, to common trends than other stock, right? This is the average. So then if the average is higher, then you can see that there's probably some stock that goes, that actually opposes this, right? There must be something that moves it up, right? So there are probably some stocks that are behaving in different ways, right? That's what you can read that from there. So this is a typical time series, right? As I told you before, right, time series is like something that is very common, you visualized, you know, the COVID-19, almost all those plots, they look at this development of the death rate and the, detect, and the detected, the, the, the infected ones over time, right? So time is always like something that people are interested in, you know, and here's the Nvidia stock over NASDAQ. Another one that I liked, was this one, the water consumption in Edmonton during the Olympic gold medal hockey game. Okay, Edmonton is in Canada and they're, they're crazy about hockey there, right? So this is basically where they, I forget who they, you know, who they, you know, this is the quarter consumption at 27th February is the green one. And the 28th February is where the game happened, okay? So they actually measured this, right? They just, just plotted over time, okay? Just plotted over time and see, you know, so they measured, when the two teams faced off, they, okay, they measured basically the time that they got, get, the water consumption was very low over time and then it went really up and then it was low again and then went really up and then it was low and went really up as compared to the original water consumption over the day before. And then you can just map it, right? You can say face off was here. That's when this game starts. And then end of first period, everyone, you know, maybe gets water or goes to the bathroom and flushes the toilet, something like this. Or 
does something, right? And then they go, then they're all sitting on the TV again. And then the back end of the everyone goes to the toilet and washes and so on, and then go down. End of the period. And just the Canadian Canada wins, everyone is at the, on the TV. There's nobody goes to the bathroom. And no one takes a shower. Everyone watches the TV. And then there's a little bit of a breather because they wait, they they think that people go away because they you know, it takes some time for the medal ceremony. And then, of course, everyone in Canada, everyone in Edmonton, everyone in Canada goes, goes, goes and sees the medal ceremony. So, and you can sort of see how these average out, right? So here there's a lot of, like a lot of lack of water consumption. And then every, like basically you take this whole area and it goes here, this whole area and goes here, right? And this whole area goes here. You know, this goes area goes here. So it's like even, right? But just everyone now, it sort of it tells a story, right? So these time series are nice nice things because they can tell stories, right? You can really relive the game by looking at the proxy, like water consumption, right? It's kind of interesting. So that's, yeah. And here you can see the, the stock, right? You can see NVIDIA is much more sensitive to any fluctuation, right? So NASDAQ goes up, NVIDIA much more. Now start going down NVIDIA much more, and here again, much, much more. And then it sort of goes up, but it's more jittery than in Nasdaq, right? So you can, you know, it, it gives you very, it gives you a lot of insight into data just by plotting it like this, right? Just by plotting it like this. That's really all. So good visualization met metaphors for time, right? So I want to give you a few of them because they, they, you know, they came up a lot, right? So one of them is called Theme River. And Theme River is really, just a stacked, a stacked, uh, a stacked line plot, right? So it's, you know, area plot, right? So here, here you see see a theme info. Basically, it it it's very interesting. They built basically each of these streams here is due to a particular term in a in a in a newspaper newspaper text analysis. This is a pretty old data set. This is like the Cuban Missile Crisis from the, from the sixties. Okay, so here you know you can see the themes. Of these articles, right? Weapons uh, and and reform and, and oil and and and, post and operatives and Yankees, right? You can see like what these newspapers talk about, and here you can see the events of time that happened, right? Your Cuba, no Soviet relations, as you right, and then Castro, and here Eisenhower breaks the relations, and then Bay of Peaks operation comes here, right? And you can sort of see. You know, all of a sudden it got really silent. The, the Yankees got really silent, right? Got much thinner. And then every, actually everything gets very silent because, you know, here again, and here it swells up, you know, by acceleration, everything got bigger, right? And there's especially this one here, which is the imperialist, imperialists, you know, the imperialists go much bigger. You can sort of see the, and this is, uh, okay. And so basically it's just a nice way to show proportions over time. And the proportion is essentially just measured by the cross section. So each of these, each of these cross sections is essentially a pie chart. You know, it's actually not really a pie, you know, pie chart. It's, you know, you know, not, not quite a pie chart. It's more like a, you know, basically you can unfold it and then you can see bars or you can see areas, you can see radius, you know. And, and but this basically shows you the streams. It also again tells you a story just now where here there was only two variables. And here there's a lot more, right? And you can really see quantities here. So it's kind of like a, a tree map, but over time, okay? So another one, what's nice about this is it's like leveled around the midpoint, right? So you basically built it by first finding a mid, the midline, and then you weave around, weave these, these, these curves around it, right? So you're the bottom and the top, and then you stack the next one, you stack the next one, the next one, the next one. Just base, stack every one of them, you know, stack, basically build, sort of build, build like these cross sections like this and connect the, connect those intersections with a, you know, with a, with a curve, right? So, so this, this here is like a, another one, you know, stream that's another, you know, basically this is like generally a stream graph and this is another stream graph. Okay, this is like the ebb and flow of movies, box office receipts from 86 to 2008, but there's still similar phenomena happens now too. So this really shows you the summer blockbusters and the holiday hits. So this is basically time and this is how much revenue each movie makes. Okay, this is like different movies, 
you know, American gangster, you know, Chipmunks, Alvin, Alvin and the Chipmunks, B movie. These were all these in, you know, Rush Hour three. So these were all movies, and it shows you like the, how much money they made on a particular, you know, instant of time, right, a particular day or two. Okay, so you'll see that you know there's like different kinds of movies in the U.S. Right, probably also in in, 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 in the, probably everywhere in all countries. Right, there's like the summer blockbusters. There's like these big movies. Everyone goes to the movies. You know, and they they make they rake in a lot of money and they go off really fast. And then in the, in the December season, like around the holidays again. Right, so this you can really see these 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 blockbusters coming up. Like everyone has time, goes to the movie, and they go quickly. And then there's other movies that get released sort of during the day and towards the Oscar season. And they don't peak much, but they're much longer. You know, they, they stay alive much longer. These are the sleeper movies, right? They basically, sometimes, some of them, they're built much later, right? This one has a very strong slope. The, the Simpsons movie has a very strong, strong slope. And this American gangster, it sort of starts probably in the back there and starts to build slowly, right? And then has a peak and takes a long time to go away, right? So this is like a typical sort of sleeper hit, right? Because of like, you know, people find out, oh, this is pretty good, I'm gonna see it, right? So it's sort of like flattened the curve. You know, this is the coronavirus, if you don't have social separation, this is the coronavirus if you, you know, if you have, right? Stuff like this, right? So you can, you can see that. So basically the height is mapped to the income, right? The box of his income and, uh, and, uh, and basically over time. So basically just all you do is like, connect measure the income here and then so you know and this is basically overlapped right stream graph this was not overlapped here it's overlapped okay so another one is this uh, stacked area chart which which is a little bit like a stream graph okay okay which which is a little bit like a stream graph but but it's it's normalized into a box so this is really truly a, a, a pie chart okay each each section is a pie chart Okay, so you know, because it always goes to one, right? It's always a, a partition of unity. This talks about how different groups spend their day, right? Eating, you know, wine, uh, sorry, uh, uh, work, household activities, um, traveling and TV and socializing and sleeping, right? So, you know, this is over time, right? You can see there's a dip for lunch, in eating and there's a dip for, for dinner and then you know then nobody eats here anymore right which is you know then the work not a lot of people stop working when they're eating right they work a lot here they work a lot here and then these and then usually at 5 p.m people go home and there's a few more people leaving and then lots of people stay and then you know and all fades out right and then most people sleep here, right? And not a lot of sleep people sleep here. Probably the people that work here, they're sleeping here, right? Because <laughs> these are the night shift people, right? They sleep during the day, you know? They're socializing, you know, towards the evening you socialize and then socializing stops, right? So you're basically it's the happy hour afterwards where you go to the bars and, and socialize. You know, some people always socialize here, you know, they start socializing in the late off, early afternoon. You know, so and and so on, right? And T. So this is basically if you get a show here, around you know around this this time here around 11 p.m. 11 a.m. Not many people watch it. So this is basically a little bit of the dead spot. This is like where the soap operas happen, right? And then here, this is prime time, right? People uh, watch a lot of TV at least back back when the data was taken, right? And here it sort of falls off. There's the late night shows here, and there's not a lot of people watching it, right? So again, this is a nice way to show time varying activities in a single chart, right? And it's normalized by percent, right? So it's like, you know, it's not like this where actual values mean matter anything. Here it's just percent because it's 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 because it's of measure of a large population, right? So how do what do it, right? How you know it's just it's more like interesting. What is the proportionality of things, right? And you can basically show it like that, right? So it's a pretty famous way of showing time-related popular events that are sort of varying over time in relation to other things, right? So this is pretty nice. So this is called the, you know, the stacked area chart. Okay, it's also a very common way to show time-related data. 
Then another one that I wanted to bring out, which is interesting, is what's called a, the, the, the application called Name Voyager. Okay, Name Voyager. And, and so this is basically uh, another stacked area chart, but not normalized to 1.0. So it's basically more of a stream graph, but, but like laid on the bottom. So this is not normalized. This is kind of like a stacked area chart, but not normalized to 1.0, right? And, and this tells you essentially how popular a particular name was in a particular time, okay? This is like 18, 1880s, 1900s, 1910, 1920, and so on until 2000. I think it's 2004. I'm not sure where it goes. And these are each each of these streams is essentially a name, right? So let's just play with this this baby name wizard a little bit, okay? So I have this web browser here. Okay, I just have to get there, okay. Um, I don't know why it's not responding. Okay, so now looking thousands, okay, it's, it needs some time to look. Okay, give it a second. Okay, now we got this, what you saw before, right? Basically the same plot that I saw before. It goes to the, this, this is basically the names obtained from in the US names in the United States. And they basically just went to the, you know, to the, you know, the, 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 the you know, where you have to register your, 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 your baby, right? The name and, and passport and so on. So explore. So now let's, let's take a name, right? Okay. Just any name to make browse it, right? And here you're going to see this is the hard to see, right? So it was Kimberly, Kenneth, now let's look for a particular name, okay? So let's look, let's look for Kevin, right? So just do, you know, okay, Kevin is here, okay? So there was a boom in Kevin, you know, so boom in Kevin around 1960, right? And then it sort of fell off, right? So you don't really, not many people name their children Kevin anymore, their boys, okay? Let's pick another one, uh, you know, Rose, okay? How many roses do you know, right? So Rose is like sort of a very old name, there's Rosemary, it's coming back, Rose is coming back. It's very interesting, right? Rose was really popular in the 1900s, you know, and then, you know, then you can see the sort of the uh, alternatives like the, you know, Rosemary and so on, right? They're very similar names, but have Rose in it. And it's coming back, right? And uh, so let's say James, you know, James is another one, right? James, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of James, right? But it still gets a little less coming, gets a little uptick, but you know, not as popular anymore. Actually, going back to the original thing, here it doesn't come out so well, okay. But I'll, okay, let's go another name. Like, you know, I looked up some, some recent names. Ah, oh, it's just so hard to. Okay, you know, you can see there's like, actually you can see the, the streams are much wider in the, here in the onset, right? They get much thinner in recent years, right? As you know, you probably have noticed right nowadays, everyone wants to give their children like a sort of a special name, right? They don't want to give any more James or, or, or John or, or Paul, right? They want to like, you know, give more special names. That's why these sort of very common names that happen a lot, right? Bob. Did I spell that right? Beep. Okay, sorry, Bob. You know, Bob is also not really frequent, right? Or Robert, right? And actually, all of these very common standardized, very standard names, you know, American names or, or Western names, right? They all go back, right? They also. So Liam is an, is an Irish name. It gets really, it became very fashionable recently, you know, 1990. Now it's really, really fashionable. Actually, I have a, a friend who has a, a boy named Liam, and the Liam is about like nine years old or ten years old, right? You know, so and so Emma is a is a name which I find interesting. It's a particular name. Like Emma was very famous. My grandma actually was named Emma, and and then, then Emma was very old fashioned, and Emma is making a big comeback. You know, Emma is getting fashionable again. Same thing with this one, Sophie. Or Sophie. I spelled it, Sophie. 
you know, Sophie is coming back too, right? So it was a long time where Sophie was unpopular, coming back, right? So Kim, Kimberly, you know. So what I'm getting at is really, okay, I don't know, like any, any, okay. Pussy, right? Let's look at, oh, this one spell it. Hussein, right? So it's coming, oh, Hassan, like another Arab name, right? So Hassan is coming, right? So this is an Arab name, right? And it means maybe more Arabs live in the US, you know, there could be, um, you know, do you know any Chinese names? Um, <laughs> uh, what's the Chinese name? You know, um, uh, you know that that doesn't come up right um okay um jun you know jun is actually more of a female name so so there was a movie kim jong in <laughs> no i'm not typing that <laughs> I hope this doesn't become I hope this doesn't become popular. But Ronald, let's look at Ronald, right? Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan, you know, was around, you know, when Ronald. So what I'm get, trying to get at is really you can actually look at these names and then you see someone of a particular name, you can use this kind of statistics to figure out how old that person is. Right? Ronald Reagan was like, a, you know, I don't know when he was born, like he was 80, so 1920s, 1930s. So Ronald Reagan, right, was sort of this age. But nowadays, not many people are called Ronald, right? But Ronald Reagan was pretty popular, right? Or, or you know, you know Emma, for example, I just showed you my grandma's name was Emma, and she was like born in a, before 1900, right, Emma, okay, sorry. You know, Emma was born, you know, this was like 1900. My grandma was like, you know, born in 1910 or something like this. So you can see, you know, you know, has a basically reincarnated now, right? So, so what's what I'm getting at is this: these names. When you meet someone of a particular name, you know, you can use your, your favorite. You know, okay, I'm not in this. Okay, there's no clauses in there. Okay, you know, so because I'm not, Klaus is not an American name. Okay, so you will not be able to figure out how old I am. Okay. Because Klaus is not an American name. So, any case, so you can go and take your, your whatever, whoever you want to do, and and Emma Watson, exactly Emma Stone, right? So it's coming back, right? So as someone mentioned here, you know, so I have a, you know, okay, so because someone has so rough, okay, is the one person who questioned, okay. Sarav is not known. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what I'm getting is this: you can use the statistics to figure out how old someone is. Okay. And this is basically getting to my next slide, because I came up, like found like long time, like not quite a while ago, I came across this paper that 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 posed the interesting question: if someone gives you like a photograph of multiple people in a in a picture and a list of names, can you take that list of names to figure out? Who, who who these people are okay you know you have a list of names these are all the people in the scene and a picture of those of those of those particular individuals can you name each person okay can you name each person okay so you know so then you just have to see i mean you can nowadays with computer vision techniques you can estimate someone's age okay that is that is from a from a face picture you, that is pretty you know that's pretty pretty well well understood how to do that right then all you have to do is really guess someone's age and then go to this program that I showed you, the statistics that I just showed you and take, figure out. So, you know, let's say I know someone is born, like from born in the 1940s, right? Or 1950s. And there is a John, right? And okay, so my, this must be John, right? You know, there's someone born, in the, someone here born in, the, in, in 2010, right? So this must be Emma, right? Or Leah. Right, because there's no, there's no, there's no Liam. You know, Liam is like a young person's name, right? And Sophie is an old person, but there's nobody that old, right? So it must be Sophie. Must be this little girl there, right? So basically, it's very interesting, right? You can go, you can go using this statistical information and computer vision techniques that can tell how old someone is, and bring them together to take the 
names and attach them to the particular people. And I found this very interesting. So okay, so let's go back to let's go back to um, to to medical data, which is really something where temporal temporal information comes is very very important, right? You know, like you want to know when someone took a medicine. You want to know like when it started working. You want to know like how a disease was progressing. You know when the when what symptoms appeared. How you how the symptoms vanished because you gave a certain treatment. How long it took. You know, a lot of things are like very important in the med in the medical in the medical arena, right? And stock too, of course, but but no medical too. So. Ben Schneiderman again, you know, we've talked about him. It's like the third time we've we've showed s some work of him. He's a fame. He's a really productive person, right? He was very has a, has left a, a big footprint in the in the in the in the area of visualization. So he he has come up with something called lifelines one and lifelines two. Lifelines two. This is essentially is this kind of medical data plotted in 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 a longer chart, right? In in the, in the time chart, right? We can see. The, you know the the you know what the, the the test they took the medication how long the medication was taken and the symptoms and 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 so on right and the, and the, and and what what so on right you can really see and the measurements right that you took right you can sort of see can relate everything together right? remember this this crime time graph that I showed you it's kind of similar right but now it's just Really modeled as lines, right? And you can sort of label it a little bit and see where things go. So this is a very common way to nowadays to 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 um, you know to to quite to give a give a on a glance overview of a particular patient. Okay, and, and all the medical history that is taken, right? You can now add a temperature plot to it. You can also add image information to it, but you can maybe click on a particular point and then see the ultrasound. That was taken at that particular point, you know, and you can, you know, and you, that's basically, there's no causality here, right? Because you, but there's just temporal ordering. You can infer causality, like you can say, you give this medication here and then the heart rate went down, right? Or you can give this medication here and all of a sudden the pulse went up, right? And you can sort of quickly see this in the sort of lifeline plot, right? So it's a very, sort of very well known sort of uh, way to show medical data in one glance. So, you know, brings out temporal categorical patterns and complaints, diagnosis, treatments, you know, and this is really good for health providers for decision making. Okay. And, uh, okay. And then you can, of course, align, rank, and filter, you know, and so on, right? And um, this is the Lifelines 2 plot. It's somewhat similar to the Lifelines 1, but what I really like particularly is this, 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 this triangular carrot here, right? You can really, What's, what's nice about this is this basically indicates the occurrence of an event, okay? And then what's nice about this is as when the occurrences are more closely together, then they form the sawtooth pattern, right? And it's basically the frequency, right? You can really read off the frequency, how often it happened at what frequency, right? And as it, if they go really close, it becomes like continuous sort of like block, right? So I really think this is a really nice way to really sort of you know, you, it's not just like a line like here, you know, where it's just a single line. It's basically something that takes up space on the bottom and then indicates precisely where the event happened. And then when you could group them together, you can see regularity, right? You can really see this is very regular. And here there's a lot of things happening, clustering. You can see clustering really nicely. Just so there's a little bit of up and down, right? You can sort of get the sense of like how frequent it is within the cluster. And at the same time, you can also see how dense it is. And here you can see, you know, this, this sort of triangle really focuses your, your, your preciseness, right? And it's, I think this is what I like, this is what I like the most about this, right? That they really, it's a good visualization technique to, to, to show your periodic and, and, and frequency information just like, you know, with a single image at the same time, right? So it's pretty nice, right? So another one that is really good is what I really liked is this one here. Um, basically from Chef, from, from uh, Eigner et al. That's a nice way. So oftentimes it's time signals, right? You have like, you know, here you have this, this uh, blood pressure, right? So, it, you know, you can sort of see the patient's blood pressure, you know, you know, 
and and as it goes up and down so you know and and, and you can you can this is like the full blown curve okay the full blown curve like all in all at once right but let's say you have like you know you have a hundred patients you want to compare right like you want to compare like a hundred patients or you want to compare the same patient you know multiple times so what you can do then is you can map these levels to different different ranges right you can take the upper level and make this the up high level and then mid level and low level you know this make this make this red yellow and green okay and then you can just label it right this is a transition from from red to yellow is then from yellow to from red and then again back to yellow and yellow to green right and just indicate this and then you you can compress it right now you can compress a little bit still the curve just compressed now you here you compress the curve and here you actually don't show the values anymore but you just show the colors and as you go up now you show only the ranges okay and then as you go all the way up to the coarsest level then you just show the you know these 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 groups right just show like what level it is red or high yellow for medium and so on right so it's sort of a nice continuous way to go from one level to another right so like you could think of it you know if you need if you need if you can give a lot of room you expand it out and get really accurate curve and if you don't have a lot of room you you compress it together in this sort of semantic zoom and you make this right and any level in between is there right so it's really continuous remember what we talked about google maps when you zoom into google maps it gets you know there's more and more more and more like detail shown and then you zoom out it the more the detail goes away right very very smoothly right all of a sudden it sort of comes the streets come and all of a sudden the blocks arrive right and then it goes back then only regions are shown and then the whole city and then the whole map of the united states right very very soft smoothly changing very fluid right this is the same thing here it goes very fluid right from from a lot of detail to a little bit of detail but the colors is slowly the colors introduced and then you know and then the color is now the detail goes away and adjust the color right so it's really a nice sort of smooth sort of um, visualization i really like this a lot it really is a good example for this multi-level multi-scale abstraction kind of technique okay by eichner et al then another way is like time sequence often appear in cyclic pattern right where you oftentimes things happen over and over again right and if you just show a lin show it like as a sequence like this as a lines as a line plot like this you know you may never really see the time varying patterns right you may you may never see it right? you may never see there is something that reoccurs all the time because it's linear right but when something reoccur it's basically like a circle right like a circle it just keeps you know it rotates around like a merry go round right it, like when something's periodic it must it must happen on, a, on something that is periodic by, by design in geometry, right? Which is a circle, right? Like a, you know, a spiral or something like this is also something periodic, right? So you wanna basically reveal these sort of periodic patterns using a circle or kind of mapping, right? So here, this is one of them. So here I'll give you a few of them, right? So you may not really know what is the cyclic, what is the cycle of it, right? It may not always be in a, a day or an hour or uh, you know something may be very there may be a hidden cycle like every you know every you know 93 minutes who knows right or every two and a half days right you don't know that right but by use by mapping the mapping the events along a cycle along a radius like along a string or a spiral you know and by changing the the how much you map on each rotation right how 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 wide you like what is the span of pe the period of time that goes around one circle, right? When you change this, you can slowly arrive at these periodic patterns, right? There's still a little bit of disorganization, but you can really see something. There's something that always happened here and something that always happened here, something that happened here and here and here and here, right? At the, all at the same time. There's some sporadic, interesting sort of noise patterns, right? which is also interesting to see now. But, you know, basically that, that what you can achieve. So these periodic kind of things, cyclic patterns, you really want to expose them in these kind of like cyclic kind of visualizations. Okay, that's pretty good, pretty good for that. Okay, so here. So another thing is what's also very interesting, 
if you want to combine space and time, right? You like want to see like where things happened and like when it happened and where, right? So where, when it happened and where, right? So you can like, you know, you did, now you have this dilemma, right? You want to show like something that evolves over time, but you want to plot it on a map. Okay, so this is this what's called the GeoTime. Oculus Info is used to be a company. They have a different name now. I forget what the name is. They're from Canada. This was actually a really famous paper, actually, this GeoTime application. So events are represented in XYT coordinate space. So the XY plane is basically geography and a map. And that vertical axis T represents time. Okay, and this is like this event over time, you know, and and it basically moved over time and and you know and you can see the speed of it right so it's like when it's really flat you know then then the speed was very high right because not a lot of time was developed you know, time is basically the t x the, the the height axis right so here it must be really, really fast right so it may be a plane that went you know relatively speaking went really fast from here to here right and then you took you took a car look took a lot longer to go right so here this is that's why it's the, that's why it's going much 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 faster that's why the vertical slope is much higher right here almost no time expired to go from here to here but a lot of time expired to go from here to here so you can sort of sort of see here you know i don't know i forget what really what really happened in this particular position but you can sort of see where you lost a lot of time right so from going from here to here you lost a lot of time traveling from here to here and traveling from here to here you know you lost actually you lost a lot of time because you stayed there maybe you know you this is where we came this was your end, end end destination you stayed there for a long long time right that's why a lot of time expired right so again this tells a nice story right you can really see how long you spent how long it took from one place to another in one visualization right you can really see how long it took to go from one place to another and where you went right so this basically now you can basically see x y and time expire right in a single visualization you know it would have a hard time if you just used as a map 2d map you know it would be hard to do right you, i mean you could basically you could do it you could take a line plot it on a map and and use a color map to to draw it just like here right you, st you start blue here and go all the way over to to the other side right to red right or you start red here and use blue here right and then sort of go through the rainbow colors right of course you're not supposed to do that because there's some resolution problems right but you could go and map it to a color on a two-dimensional displays but spatial distort spatial mapping is much more powerful because you know your eye is really sensitive to spatial changes right and you can really easily see it color changes you're much less sensitive to but spatial changes are very, very sensitive to. You can really quickly see the difference between two heights, you know, because you walk around in three-dimensional space all your life, right? So you've learned how to do 3D vision, right? So now this makes perfect, this makes perfect use of this three-dimensional reasoning that you have, right? So it's a pretty good visualization of geo time, okay? Then this is another picture of it that I found okay so um this is another picture of it i forget what it is so yeah i don't know what it is so but anyway it's like another picture. you can probably you can compare different different uh different uh, street different time sequences you know the yellow the green and the blue okay how they behaved over different geolocations you know so this is different people i think so okay then so now one thing I want to talk about is interaction, right? So complex increases interaction capabilities are key, right? So, you know, you want to like, you know, have interaction to, to help you a little bit with managing all of these different time series, okay? That may happen, right? So, you know, so basically control the level of detail you show for some aspects and, and increase, you know, basically increase the level of detail for some aspects, aspects and decrease it for others. Okay, so I want to like show you a video, really old system by called Life Rack by Mac Lachlan et al. And and I want to show you this video. This is basically this interface that they have. So look at it. It's a dashboard, right? But a very very it looks almost looks like a spreadsheet dashboard, right? So you don't have to build a dashboard like this, but it's really really beautiful, right? You can really 
when you as you stretch out these cells you can see the visual time curves and as you compress them you can only see like key events you can also stretch it out in the y direction you can see more height or less height you know here you only see the landmarks and here you can see the full curve here you don't really see here you just see the uh, colors of high and low right what i showed you before is a beautiful example for this multi-resolution viewing so let me show you a video that that i have collected okay and i'll i'll, I'll increase the power a little the the, the uh, sound quality a little bit okay so here's it fly rack interactive visual exploration of system management time series data we show LiveRack, a visualization system for viewing large quantities of time series data in the domain of system management. Monitored devices are represented by rows. This label shows aggregate information about a group, NFS, with four devices. Columns show one or many parameters collected from the devices. This column shows CPU usage. In the current overview, each cell is a small colored block. In these four cells, green means CPU utilization is above 35%. As I make the cells larger, labels for the individual devices become visible. Also, when the cells get big enough, the server is queried for more data, and then the representation changes from blocks to spark lines. Making a cell even bigger results in semantic zooming to show a more detailed line graph. We can see the current time range by looking at the time boxes to the bottom left and bottom right of the data area. The blue lines show progressive search results. I'm searching on NFS to flight the devices I've already stretched out. Interpreting network environment state. I'm acting in the role of a network administrator interested in looking at CPU utilization of the top few offenders. I begin by sorting the CPU column and then performing a stretch operation on the top few rows to obtain more detailed trend information. The spark lines show trend data for one week. The red squares on each trend line indicate a high watermark. I can see a number of the web devices share the same high watermark in the middle of the week. Load, a measure that accounts for I.O. in addition to CPU usage, was also at a peak for this device during this time. But I noticed this was not the case for Scoop, where load peaked early in the week and CPU later on. I.O. load was also not correlated to CPU usage on Tweak. We can see a steep drop in the number of processes running on Tweak at the exact same time as Manipulator. This drop correlates with a drop in memory usage which freed up some swap memory as well. When I grow the memory and swap cells for tweak, I can see that a small, slow increase in memory usage was enough to cause the swap in the first place, and that it seems to run quite near the threshold where swapping begins. This device can definitely benefit from more memory. Manipulator does not share these characteristics. We can see that memory usage built through the week for Manipulator, correlating with the period of heavy CPU utilization and load, but that the memory was properly released when load dropped and no swap was used. I expand my time window to six months to see whether some of these trends extend over a longer period of time. Six months is a large query, so it takes a while to get the new data from the server located on the other side of the country, which stores data for dozens of parameters on thousands of devices across several years. The yellow dots show that the new data hasn't arrived yet, but I can still interactively explore on the visualization client in the meantime. Here's an interesting trend. The utilization on Scoop is trending downwards. We can also see that there was a steep drop in memory usage on several devices in August. Network inbound and outbound traffic also seems to be trending downwards. I might want to consider consolidating some of these devices if these trends continue. This data is pretty interesting, so I'll dump a report to show my customer. I preview the data here and then export it to Excel. Incident investigation. Okay, so I stop here now. Um, this is video. Not my lecture. <laughs> so, oh, where was I? So yeah, I was here. So basically, this is a really nice system, right? Because it it really shows you like this this sort of multi-resolution viewing, right? Where you can expand out the cells in the x and y direction. X direction, you basically show more detail in the, in the time 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 and then why you can show more detail in the height right and it's really fluent so it's a pretty good pretty good pretty nice interface it's pretty old actually it's like from the 1990s i think so you know it's pretty nice so the video we also so now now time series you know that have no end basically those are called streaming 
data, right? The streaming data, for example. Credit card, point of sale transactions, you know, there's like no end to this, right? People keep buying things, you know, and 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 web stream streams and social streams happen all the time, right? And the, there's a lot of volume there, right? And a lot of different veracity and, and volume and, and so on, right? So, you know, scale super linear, right? So, so basically these things have a one pass constraint because, you know, you can't really store it at the same, you cannot really store all of it at the same time. You can't really, you know, some of it, you, I mean, you, but, you know, nowadays you can buy big, big servers, but for visualization purposes, you can't really look at all of it at, at the same time, right? So you need to like make, take a peek what you're going to see. So, you know, there's these, these things when you visualize these data, there's like several interesting cons have things happening, right? If you like try to get a snapshot, right? And then consider the history of what, 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 what happened. Then what happened really, there's these, these three concepts called concept drift concept evolution and feature evolution, right? Because that happens as the data evolves over time, things change. So here's like some, some uh, you know, from a classification task, right? Let's say you have a classifier, you know, for example, a support vector machine where you classify, you know, those empty circles with the full ones, right? This could be like one class and the other one, right? And then a negative instance and positive instance. And then, then as you move on, the, you know, for example, you know, it could be like a, a spam, a piece of spam, spam or like a or like a hack or something. Thieves get more inventive, right? They gotta be close, they're gonna be closer to, you know, what is considered to be legal, right? So they're gonna make their make their spam more close to the legal. And so you need to move your classification hyperplane to catch those, right? So this is very a typical area where you where your classification bounding or whatever you have used to capture like the semantics or the gist of the data that moves over time, right? Here again, right? It, it tilts a little bit and here it actually changes completely, right? So, so this is called concept drift, okay? Because the, the concept that you understand what is yes and no shifts over time, okay? Another one is concept evolution, where you, where you basically evolve a concept, right? So you, let's say you have a clustering A, C, B, and D, that you know about, right? So this is basically the, the, these data items go here and so on. And then slowly as you collect, as you collect data, this novel class appears, right? The novel class appears. And then, you know, but at the, at, the, at, the, at the beginning, you don't know, right? You collect a few points and you they outliers and you think, are these now outliers or the, is that a new trend, right? You don't really know, right? So you have to keep collecting, be, be aware of this, that there may be a new class coming up, right? And be, 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 be aware of it, call it an outlier for now, but then eventually collect more statistics about it. And eventually you find out, oh, wow, you know, this is actually a new class. Maybe an old class disappears. It could also happen, right? An old class may, may no longer be, no longer be all vogue, right? It disappears, right? So all of these things sort of happen over time, right? In streaming data, okay? So this concept drift, you know, is basically a really significant thing you need a, and this concept evolution as well, which is concept evolution and feature evolution are very similar, right? And because they're both in clusters and the attributes are sort of formed of maybe features change, they modify and they may, the cluster may also change because of this. So concept drift, if you do clustering, you need to deal with this, right? And there's a program called class stream or clue stream, such an algorithm. So the way it works is this, it does microclustering, okay, to to figure out what these what these what these what these clusters are, and then modifies them on the fly, okay. So let's say there are k microclusters, okay. You know, so so when a new data point comes in, what you'll do, you'll either attribute it to one of those microclusters, you know, or absorb it, or you make an own cluster, okay. So the way you do this is in this is this algorithm here. So basically, when a new algorithm comes, when a new point comes in, then you'll have to determine the distance to all those current microcluster centroids, okay, and figure out, you know, if it's far away or not. So you can you can compute a Mahalobis distance that measures the probability of being in each cluster. You know, if the probability is very low, right, then then it must be a new point, right? Then of course you have to figure out if it's an outlier or not, right? But but you know, so you keep track of this you know, if there's more, more of them are joining, right? 
So either you, so if it's within a cluster, if the Mahalobis distance to one of those clusters, probabilistic distance to one of those clusters is pretty high, you'll just take this point and assign it to the closest cluster and update the statistic of that cluster. If it doesn't fall in, then you create a new micro cluster. Okay, so let's say, you know, you have a space constraint, you can't, you don't want to maintain more than n micro clusters, okay, micro clusters, okay. <clears throat> Whenever you form a new microcluster, you have to somehow sacrifice an old one, right? So what does old mean? Okay, old means you can either take one of those microclusters that exists right now and merge it together with two with another cluster, with another microcluster, and and basically form a larger microcluster. Okay, so now all, all you just delete it. Okay. So now you basically want to keep track of how old those points really were in that microcluster that you want to either join or delete, right? So you have a motion of staleness, okay, this timestamp. So basically you keep a timestamp for each microcluster when it was last, when, 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 when was the last time you added something to it, right? So if that time happened a long time ago, right, then you know, okay, maybe I can safely delete it, right? Or you know, if it doesn't happen, happen as long ago, then you maybe merge it with one that is that is more newer. You know, so this is up to you, right? So it's there's like three operations: create a new microcluster, delete an old one, or merge them together, right? You know, this is basically these three decisions to keep. So you have to constantly monitor these clusters, right, and, and decide what you want to do. And this is basically you know streaming microclustering or clustering under under streaming conditions, data conditions. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is this notion of time queue. Okay, time queue, where you where you have um, you know, let's say you have two attributes, burglary and theft. They have and they happen over time. Okay, so burglary and theft, two crimes happen over time. Okay, and 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 you know, and um, you know you can visualize the burglary and theft together, right? Whenever there's so these are states, okay? These are states. You know, each state has so much burglary and so much theft, okay? So these are basically states or counties or whatever you want to have, like any or cities, whatever it is. So each data point really is a is a city, and it falls here, right? And these are these different cities. So whenever you know, because each city essentially is like a an experiment, right? So whenever you measure, whenever there is a lot more theft for like a city like that has a lot of crime. Then burglary tends out to be high too. But in another city that's very peaceful, you know, then then you know then there's not a lot of theft. There's also don't don't turn out to be not a lot of burglary. So there's really a correlation between the two, and this happens over time, right? So there's no, you know, each each state may have different amount of theft and burglary over time, right? So basically now you have this time queue, right? Basically it comes down to this, right? So this is the different states. The different the different crimes, right? And and now what you have, essentially, you have one point here, and you uh, this happens over time, right? This is like two times the time series. Okay, and you can compute the time, the difference of these time series. For example, you can compute the you know the different the different theft patterns over time for California and Arkansas and compare them, right? You know, stuff like this. So. There really, for clustering, there really are various ways you can you can cluster the data. You can basically take, make this a feature vector. Like you can compare Michigan and Tennessee in terms of all the crimes they have, right? And compute the similarity across the crime axis. Or you can compute the similarity of two crimes over different states, right? You can figure out, because you need to do a little bit of statistics, right? You can, if you just take a state and compare the two crimes, it doesn't really tell you the difference of the how 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 similar these crimes are. Remember here, we showed that right. We showed that the similarity of burglary and theft, right? We took two, two. We took different states and check, figured out and plotted the theft over the burglary and found out there is a correlation, right? And the same thing we do here, right? We have to compare. So we look at these different states as as micro experiments, you know, and and measure how how you know, here we measure like how, how you know, you know, we measure, basically here we, we took the different crime patterns as experiments and measure and compare two states. And here we took two, all the states and took two crime patterns and, and, and looked at them if they're similar, 
right? So this you can do, right? Or you can do similarity of crime over time, right? For a given state, right? Now you take the time dimension, compare similarity, right? So you can compare last if Larson C and theft, motor vehicle theft have similar patterns in over time, right? Could be interesting, right? Whenever there is high larcency, there's also a lot of motor vehicle theft. But maybe they're unrelated. Maybe there's a lot of theft, but not a lot of motor vehicles, you know, larcency, right? Or maybe arson is not, not at all related to burglary, right? You don't know that, right? But you have to compare them. Or you can compare different states in terms of a same particular crime over time. You can say Ohio and Illinois have very similar development in arson, right? Interesting, right? And then you can take all the different pairs of states, right? You can take, you know, you can compare, you can, pair, you know, and then look at arson, how it developed over time. You know, is there like anything that the other, other states that are similar and the other states are not so similar, right? So, so this is basically now taking time into account, okay? So what you can class with these measures, you can, you cry time, crimes and average them over time. Okay, you can take the crimes and average them over time. Then you can measure, then you can measure, then you can, then you can get a little better assess, assess, assessment of crime. Right now, if you didn't look time, right, you just look at one particular year. And if you average them over time, you can look at the crimes as a whole. Maybe there's some outliers over time, right, by averaging them that you eliminate those outliers. You can do the same thing also with states. You can average them over time on the states, right? And you can compare them, you know, in terms of the crimes, right? You know, so you can do the crimes in a given state, taking the time series in account, or states for a given crime, taking the time series account, right? Then you take the, take the time series and you, you compute the crimes for all the different states, right? But use the time series vector to compare them, all the states, take the same series and vector into account, right? Or you can just use all these different time series and do one, or you can do this different, you, you can compare the times or the, the, the crimes or the states, but, you know, make, one, make one, one, one comparison for each year and plot them all together in one particular visualization. Then you can sort of see trends as they happened over time, right, that you can do as well. So, you know, then you can, you can also do this, you can compute this time aware similarity distance for a pair of states. For a given pair of states, IJ, for each crime, you compute a time series similarity, which is this, and sum all of them up, right? And then basically you have each, for each pair of states, you do this. Or you can do the same thing for the pair of crime and, and do, do, do it for all the states, right? Then you can sort of, aver you sort of average these things over crime over, over states and plot it like that. Or as I said before, you just look at each year separately and see how sort of plot all of them in the same space, same state, space, and then see how it sort of evolves over time, right? So what I'm trying to say, tell you basically is, you know, that that it's really difficult to, to use time, bring time into the picture, right? Because, you know, somehow now you have all of a sudden, you no longer have a two-dimensional spreadsheet, now you have a three-dimensional one. A tensor kind of way, right? Then, then you need to sort of figure out how you can bring all these things together, right? Because time is not the time is not really a dimension, right? Time is a different dimension, so you have to, you know, take that into account. So you may ask, what happens if the time series is not aligned, right? One crime might cause another one, you know. So you know, then then you, all you do with these align, all you do with these time series distance measures, right? That all falls apart, right? So you have you can use something called time warping. Also, if you want to bring a geospatial component in your data, right? How do you compare them over space, right? How do you make a vector out of space? So we'll talk about this too. Okay. So let's talk about 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 time series, uh, you know, alignment, right? So if you take this distance here, pairwise distance x i minus y i, and you compare it like this, you know. There may be one thing that may be shifted to another by right? time series A, maybe slightly shifted to time series B, or maybe it's like not linearly shifted, maybe it's like shifted a little more in some place, shifted a little less in another. Then this distance measure where you compare these two time series may not be any more accurate because there, may, there was a delay in one time series, right? Time series B was the originator and time series A was responding to it, right? But now there's a little bit of a delay 
in in the in the effect to, to in the cause to be to be represented and to be to be become an effect right so there's a delay but if you if you map them together right you never discover this so there's something called dynamic time warping which tries to overcome this problem right so it looks for these peaks and tries to align them okay so this is the euclidean this is the dynamic time warping so it takes basically tries to align this peak with this peak okay and so on right so basically here it feathers out a little bit right this thing this point here has many partners right and then you align them like this align them like this align them like this and here there's a compression going on and then you basically map this here and align this again and align this so this is time where this is dtw dynamic time burping that is a really nice way to align two different time sequences that may be a little bit misaligned because of delays but this way you can overcome that right so you find basically you try to find out where they behave in similar ways right where the where they behave in similar ways so this goes up this goes up a little earlier so you map them right so that's basically dynamic time warping okay so the key here really is there's no skipping beginning or ends right so things it has to be continuous you always have to go from left to right always have to go from left to right for both series and you have to keep connecting right you cannot skip or go back so that's not possible right it can't go back in time okay so really have to go here sometimes you go to be, go a little faster in one time sequence and sometimes you go a little slower in one time sequence right so basically you, you proceed you know try to align it by going fast or slow in either one of the time sequence and then you can get something like this right euclidean you go like this dtw you go like this and this is basically essentially done with a with a um, with a you know a, a, this this kind of approach okay dynamic there's a it's a dynamic uh, programming approach where you do this right so i don't want to go into detail on this but basically this is time series a and this time series b and you compute all these different pairings and you compute the optimum right you find the optimum path to these different pairings right where you compare different time points different time points here and you connect them and then you come up with a path that is optimal okay and that's basically how time time dynamic time mapping works it's basically a dynamic programming where you optimize a metric a similarity metric basically you know whenever it's not similar then it can't be true right so try to try to find a more a mapping or warping where the similarity is optimized and this is happens for this particular path this particular mapping so here it went to, here time series b went a little faster and, all, and then time series here time series a went a little faster right so you can really see this okay